all forego such a beautiful evening to come. Um, so, uh, what? Hold it up to my mouth. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is uh, I'm going to do sort of an introduction to the content of the book called uh, Material Operations. And um, I'm going to show just a couple of the introductory projects which sort of gets the ball rolling, uh, which uh, leads to interesting places, I think, um, at least f interesting to us. Uh, and I should, and I'd like to begin by just explaining how this uh, work began, because it's not a sort of architectural work in the sense that we have previously provided done architectural work. Because uh, it's by and large, even though what you're going to see at the, in my presentation is early projects which, <laughs> of which uh, two were commissioned, uh, they, by and large these are non-commissioned works that we've done within the office uh, for simply to satisfy our curiosity and to follow a train of thought that is interesting to us. Uh, and uh, to preface the discussion of that work, I'd like to also say that our office has um, been characterized by chronic lack of work over its entire history. Uh, <laughs> and um, as a consequence of that, we've had to figure out what to do most of the time when nobody wanted us to do anything. <laughs> and so what we decided to do in the old days was to build models of projects that we had designed and were, was under construction. And those models would be done in a manner that was not representational so much as analytical, in which those models would try and investigate some of the uh, driving forces in the project and represent those in a more uh, overt way than might be uh, perceivable in the buildings. And we did those projects uh, through the 80s and the 90s. And as the digital age sort of overtook us, um, that work began to diminish. And there was a period of time where there wasn't too much of that kind of uh, purely investigative work. Maybe that coincided with the fact that we actually were fully employed. But, um, but nevertheless, um, uh, uh, there was a history in the firm, and I sh there, are, there are members in the, uh, in the audience who are current employees and partners in the firm, as well as former uh, employees, and I should say that uh, you have to understand that this is a big group of people who have been involved in this over time, and uh, we've had contributions from many and continue to do that, and the work now is being sort of uh, spearheaded by uh, a younger, more energetic group uh, than uh, us, but we get to observe the, the, the results of uh, all of our labors. But what happened was that um, after the interval when we no longer made these models, and as you may know, Pat was splitting her time between teaching at UBC and working in the office, at <coughs> about six years ago she decided to retire from teaching. She did, did that because she felt that it was too difficult for her to do both things uh, and still have some quality of life. And so um, she decided on the office. I don't know that she regrets that decision, but <laughs> that's what she decided on. And, but when she came into the office, she said she wasn't going to spend all of her time doing the waste of time stuff that we normally did. She was going to... You did. You did. Uh, she said that she wanted to investigate things more in, that were more interesting and more serious. And so, okay, fine, fine, no problem. But fortunately, uh, the shortly, very, very shortly after she retired, uh, she took a call from Winnipeg, uh, which is where we both grew up and where we went to university. Uh, and where they had a program of temporary shelters on the river for skating. 
And um, this was early in the program, I think it was the second year, and they said as uh, alumni of the university, they wanted to invite us to uh, do some skating shelters uh, in the second iteration um, and that would be outside of the normal process of selection, which is sort of a competition process. And so she said, great, um, uh, she's, she would do that. And so I'm going to explain sort of how that transpired into material operations. And material operations now exists as a significant body of work. I think we've got, done probably 18 or more projects. Uh, the book, which is available here tonight, uh, documents in great detail 11 of those projects. And the detail is important because the intention is that the process, how we do these things, is every bit as important as the outcome of that process. And so, uh, and it's certainly, uh, we've previous published books previously and Pat's always been highly critical of those because they didn't show that development. And so the book is dedicated to that. And so I think that you, you're, you're happy, right? Yeah, <laughs> you're happy about that. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to do the clicker. Uh, so. Um, we were invited to do a, some skating shelters on the river, Red River, and we were given a budget, I believe, of $20,000 for the design and fabrication of the... 2000 2000 No way. <laughs> really? That's ridiculous. And you agreed to that? Oh. Well, I'll tell you something. These self-same skating shelters are being fabricated as we speak in London for an exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum this summer, and the budget is 100,000 pounds. So from $2,000 in Winnipeg to $100,000 in London, there you go. Uh, so, so Pat said yes, that, she would, that uh, we would like to do these things, and uh, she deserves sort of all of the credit for getting this ball rolling. And so this is the site on the Red River in Winnipeg, if you know it. And the Red River freezes over, and uh, Winnipeg has winters that are, can be quite long. And so skating on the river is a great thing. Uh, uh, and the shelters are important because winter winds can be quite cold and cutting in Winnipeg. And so Pat began, and I'm telling her story here because uh, she really deserves the credit for initiating this. She began by taking these two things out of our kitchen. One is a bag, I think it had a Japanese pear apple in it, uh, which she stuck a chopstick through, or the plastic cup, half of a plastic cup, which she put an elastic band around. And these diagrams document the simple proposition that if you take a material and you apply a force, that deforms that, that uh, material will take on structural and spatial characteristics. And that's the premise of the entire book. And it has resulted in a huge variety of things, including these uh, contraptions that are sitting beside me here. Okay. So uh, beginning with uh, wood, veneer, she began to model um, possible ideas of what um, the shelters might be. And so you can see the sort of incipient form of the skating shelters here. And we decided that we needed to go work at full size in real materials, that this was not a design so much as a design build kind of proposition where we really were working with the thing and how it performed. And so we went and bought <coughs> some, the thinnest plywood we could find, and we tried to stick it together and boy, it did not work. What we found was it didn't bend in the same way that the veneer bent. Look at the curvature in the veneer and things like that. Uh, the plywood just didn't do that. And not only that, it was too small. We couldn't actually get into this thing. And so we searched around for a material that would be more suitable than plywood. And we found a product called bendy ply. So bendy ply is a product that's been developed 
to facilitate cladding of spiral stairs and things like that in mill workshops. And, and the important characteristic to understand about the difference between wood veneer and plywood is that wood veneer is an anisotropic material, which is to say it has different characteristics depending upon which axis uh, uh, you are bending it on. Wood is strong vertically and much, much weaker laterally because of the need for the tree to stand up. Plywood is designed specifically to eliminate that characteristic of wood. So plywood is lapped in opposing directions, and so the piece of plywood that we got was stiff and wouldn't bend in the same way, and it's called an isotropic material because it's, it behaves in similar manner in both axes. And so <coughs> what we found was there was a product called bendy ply, and bendy ply has a thin veneer in one direction and two thick veneers in the opposite direction. The consequence is that bendy ply is anisotropic. It bends very easily in one axis and is very strong in another axis. So you can make a structure which is very strong, but also very uh, able to form shells, which are also strong, with bendy ply, which you cannot do with plywood, at least at the scale that we are working in. At a larger scale, maybe not so much a problem. So we began working with bendy ply and we began, we have a workshop in our office and we began building these things and uh, a lot of the uh, development of this work was uh, led by a fellow by the name of James Ides who worked at, for us at that time, extremely talented guy and he was sort of leading this process but <laughs> the thing was it was so interesting that people started to wander out of the office and back into the workshop at all hours of the day and pretty soon there was a huge uh, support group that were, that were working with James to do this thing. And so he, we began to work at full scale. And what we were able to do is by getting very thin bendy ply, uh, we could actually layer bendy ply together and sheet it up to make larger than four by eight sheets because, so our sheets were actually two layers of bendy ply that were lapped to extend the dimensions of the plywood which made it big enough to actually occupy. And so this is the, the thing that we built almost more by cutting and pasting in the shop than by drawing or modeling. Uh, and uh, once we had done that, uh, we were off to the races because it was quite an interesting thing. And here you can see, so this has got two layers of bandy ply. Where it's perforated, it's only one layer of bandy ply. And so we decided that we would just perforate the single layer just to uh, exaggerate the fact that we didn't need to double the layers everywhere. Uh, it's really actually quite an interesting pattern if you take the pieces apart. It, and, and where we had extreme curvature, we had to relieve the stresses, so we cut a slot and we made a, uh, a curve at the end. And you can see that curve reappear in these steel pieces where the end of the cut has been curved to deal with uh, stresses. Okay, and, and where the two pieces of plywood would collapse on one another, we simply cut them off like cutting a scissor and boom, it popped out to be this spectacular sort of oculus. And so uh, this was uh, a process of uh, sort of uh, discovery and fabrication using a material and playing with the material and trying to find ways, that's not me, trying to find ways to uh, uh, emphasize the characteristics of the assembly in its process. And so even where it's attached to a base, you can see that we acknowledge the fact that there's one layer or two layers because we have a long tradition in the office, architectural tradition of detailing. So these things are just sort of second nature that is fell out uh, in the process. And we took it all apart once we built it, and we measured it in the same way that a seamstress would take a shirt apart after they'd fitted a client, and then we had a pattern. Uh, and once we had that pattern and all the details of how you put it together, and here are sort of the kinds of pieces that we, oop. So you get all of these kinds of pieces that almost look like fabric, 
pieces that would go into sewing, uh, and they go together. And then we began to think about, okay, so we've got $2,000, really? <laughs> okay, so we said, what can we do for $2,000? We've got to do more than one. And we came upon, I don't know, they must have come up with extra cash. I can't believe it. they did it. For, they didn't. We did. Oh, we did. <laughs> <laughs> That's how most of our problems get solved. Uh, so anyway, uh, we decided that we needed to have more than one. And that was, I think, key to the success of the piece because it's the cluster, the sociability of this group of six. We decided that we needed six. We needed to form a society of skating shelters. And I think that is central to their character. And so here we began by looking at two, and we were now modeling them for these purposes in veneer. Um, okay. Okay. And so here we put groups of two together in different configurations to form a cluster of six. And we modeled that cluster. Okay. I'm doing something wrong, I know. Um, and so we sent that all off to Winnipeg, and they built it. There were some incidents along the way, which I don't have time to tell you about, but they're interesting because they inform even more the knowledge that we're gaining about these, the performance of these materials. Uh, and then uh, my uh, great friend, our great friend, Jimmy Dow, who has been our photographer for 40 years, uh, went to Winnipeg with James, and it was 35 below to photograph these uh, skating shelters. And I should tell you that Jimmy is trained by Ansel Adams. So he's a traditional uh, portrait or a tripod uh, photographer. There's never a handheld camera to him is anathema. I mean, it's, it's basically reeks of lack of discipline. And so he began at 35 below plowing through the snow to begin to photograph these things. It didn't last long, I gotta tell you. <laughs> At 35 below, discipline was thrown to the wind. And so the tripod was jettisoned and away he went. And here you begin, and, and this is Winnipeg. 35 below, they're still skating on the river. That's pretty amazing. Um, and here these uh, shelters are on the ice. Uh, oop, and there is a hardy group of skaters. We didn't have many that day uh, during the photography, but there were some. Uh, and uh, here are these uh, creatures that are out there. And it's kind of interesting. I didn't, haven't explained some of the sort of practical design characteristics. There is a ridge and very steep uh, uh, form going up to it. So snow doesn't settle on this thing. Snow falls off it. Uh, they actually shake in the wind. And so that helps to keep them clear of those loads as well. So the ability to keep snow off was key to our ability to use extremely thin materials, which were basically acting as sprung forms, as shells that were under tension. They were held in shape by, they were held in shape by the plan form of the base and two, a ridge spine and a back spine. And then all the plywood was just doing everything else. And it, so it was an extremely efficient uh, shell structure. And so here you see them. Uh, they're uh, very interesting things. Uh, there is an interior, and we made benches uh, or little stools out of the, with the same principles. And then, at <coughs> of course, you need the nighttime shot, the evening shot, right? And so Jimmy had to go back after warming up, and it was 40 below. So, and now he had to, he brought, the tripod came back out, and he set the camera up, and he had to wait for that perfect moment of light. Simon, you know all about the perfect moment of light. And, and when he got it, uh, he took the picture. And so, uh, and of course, it, this just demonstrates how the life of these things is dependent on so many different um, people and so many different skills. I mean, it's the people in the office, it's the people uh, making these things, it's the people in Winnipeg, it's the photographer who, and this project has become sort of emblematic of this whole exercise because it's become so well known around the world. 
<coughs> we were given an award in Moscow. They said, are you coming for the award? We said, no, we can't come. So we had to pay to get this big metal sculpture sent to us. Uh, we're going to the Victoria and Albert, all of this. And I think much of it is a function, not so much of what we did, or as much of what, what Jimmy did, the photographer, as what we did. In any case, uh, as this was all unfolding, I was teaching a class, uh, uh, an architecture class at Yale University, and our project was um, to build or to design a facility for kids in high school who weren't academically gifted, but who had the great facility for making things. Uh, and we chose as the location for this uh, the Eli Whitney uh, Museum and workshop in Hamden, Connecticut. Eli Whitney was the great American inventor and um, in an era predating Edison and people like that. And when we were there, uh, the director of the museum said to me, have you seen the video Between the Folds? And I recommend it, it's very interesting, it's about origami. And it's all about uh, people who practice origami and it begins with traditional people doing or traditional origami, so a thousand folds, you get an elephant and things like that. And it ends with people who are using origami as a technique for mathematical analysis and for science research, because it's uh, fully mathematical. It's a physical manifestation of mathematical principles. Uh, and in the middle of all of this, there was a guy by the name of Paul Jackson, who taught origami in Israel. And he was asked by his students, uh, can you uh, make origami with only one fold? And he said, well, no, you can't, because it takes you know, 150 folds to make an elephant, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You, you, it's all based on the multiplicity of folds that generates the form. But the question continued to sort of intrigue him. And so this is what he did. This is our recreation of what he did. He took a piece of origami paper and folded it. And then he, because paper is, and this is very important, paper is fibrous in its structure, it can be deformed. And so he stuck his finger and broke the fold and was able to create this lovely form at the end, which is a structural and spatial unit, uh, all out of one fold. And so I thought, well, that's really interesting. You know, uh, it would be great. And you can see, you can do all sorts of things with this and, and you, you adjust the proportions and you can get uh, really remarkable forms. Okay, so I said, let's go into the shop and let's take a piece of galvanized sheet metal and let's see whether we can do it. And so we scored the sheet metal uh, so that we could fold it more easily and we actually made a hole where we were gonna bend it. And so we folded it and then we broke it through the bend at the hole. And if you know anything about steel fabrication, once you fold steel, it becomes unbelievably strong. I mean, that becomes a remarkable structural sort of uh, device. And so breaking the fold is very, very difficult. And we had to put some serious muscle into doing this to this 24 gauge sheet metal. And so I then took this thing and I went around to steel fabricators in Vancouver and I said, uh, you see this, uh, what I would like is to make this, but much bigger. And I would like to know if you could uh, make this for me. And they said, absolutely. What we're gonna do, we're gonna take a piece of sheet metal and we're gonna cut it much bigger, much heavier. We're gonna cut it into triangles. We're gonna roll it in a rolling machine. We're gonna uh, weld it back together again and we'll give you this. And I said, well, no, because I don't want that. I want the beautiful curve that comes out of the mechanism of folding and breaking the steel, not some predetermined curve that you're gonna get with a roller. And they said, well, we can't do that. Steel will not do that. And fortunately, there were some young guys in our office who did, didn't believe that. And so we decided to try and invent a way in which we could do that. And you have to understand that what we're trying to do is to take a piece of steel that's folded and then bend it across the fold, which is, unless you do extreme violence to the sheet, that cannot be done. And so slowly, and we built six machines over the course of a number of months the, over the summer, 
that were slowly, incrementally designed to make this mechanism happen. And the key to this is to do it simultaneously, to fold it and break it at the same time so that it's not fully folded when you start breaking it, because if it's fully folded, you can't break it. And so the machines, and there were six of them, one, and this is, I don't know, we're going through two, three, whatever the number is, and here they are making them and they're getting increasingly refined, and here they're getting, the pieces are getting bigger, and we're getting, starting to do this, and then we end up uh, getting even bigger, and then finally, we're now, I'm gonna go, so we're now um, at the size of the largest piece of stainless steel you can buy in Vancouver, which is five by 12 feet. And so this machine is about 14 feet long, and it's designed to fold and bend steel at the same time. And so there it is, and there, oop. So here are these guys, and here you see the machine gets set up at the top, and the piece of sheet metal gets dropped in. That's, I think it's 18-gauge uh, stainless steel. And then the top piece gets put in, and because we don't have hydraulics, we had to drill holes and use bolts to press the two halves of our form together. And you can see that we assemble it and we start to do it. And as we're tightening the bolts, which are folding the steel, we're also lifting the middle of it, where the joint is, to, with an engine hoist, to slowly cause it to break at the same time. And so here it is, and it starts out there, and it ends up in the bottom right-hand corner, and there it is in our shop. Um, and so we were able to uh, simultaneously fold and bend and create this form. Subsequently, we now have a new project where we've figured out how to make it much bigger, and we have plans uh, for what to do with that. Um, but, and this is, this is one of them, this is a, uh, um, oops. This is uh, double the size of what we've done in our shop. And we're hoping to figure out, we, I think we figured out how to make it now. And now all we need is somebody who wants us to make it, which is, <laughs> <coughs> which has always been our problem. Uh, and so there it is. And so then while we were doing all this stuff and we were having a ton of fun and w way more fun than architecture, I got to tell you. Uh, <laughs> Because, as my friend Omer Arbel said, in, when you're doing this stuff, everybody says yes. Yes. More. When you're doing architecture, they always say no. <laughs> no. Less. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we got a call from uh, Comme des Garçons, uh, the uh, Japanese uh, fashion house uh, from... Uh, 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 actually, their Paris office, which is their headquarters, and they said that they were opening a new store in Ginza in uh, Tokyo, and they would like us to design and build uh, some objects which could be change rooms or display things in the Ginza shop. We said, great. Uh, they said, and, we, and we're phoning you because we really love the wood skating shelters. However, in Tokyo, the Fire code is so stringent that there's no way you're going to do a wood uh, element. And we said, don't worry. We, we've got an idea. And they said, OK, good. So uh, uh, here we go. So and there's Ray Kawakuba, who is the designer for, of Comme des Garçons. And this is one of her pieces. And I think you can see why <laughs> she likes the skating shelters. And I, so anyway, she likes the skating shelters. Uh, so we said, OK, uh, we have an idea that isn't combustible. It's made of stainless steel. And so we proposed to her that we would take these th things that we'd made in our shop at the size of the ones in the shop, and we would stand them on end, which they can do. And we would, with a little bit of uh, auxiliary pieces, we would make these forms which could be used as change rooms or as display units. And uh, we said, oh, they're gorgeous. She's going to love it. And we sent it to her, and she said, no. <laughs> I, said, I, thought, I thought we were out of the architecture business, but <laughs> apparently not. She said, no, they are too artistic. 
I, you can't question what a client says, right? I mean, they have every right to be inscrutable uh, because they're the client. In any case, we said, okay. They said, we want something much more like the skating shelters. And so, scheme two. And, you know, the interesting thing is, if we had done scheme one, we wouldn't really have learned much beyond the exercise before. But because she rejected that and we had to do scheme two, we actually learned a ton about stainless steel in, uh, in ways that we hadn't learned in the first. So this is our second proposal. It's strongly related to the skating shelters, but it's actually in many, many subtle and important ways quite different. Um, uh, it's two forms made of stainless steel, similar in character to the skating shelters, but shells made of steel rather than of wood. Uh, and in the course of executing this work, because we were des contracted to, to design and fabricate and then ship to Japan. So uh, we began, uh, okay, so our method for the skating shelters, which is what this is, is to basically do some sort of, uh, what is the word, dressmaking to use patterns, to use irregular forms and putting them, put them together in disciplined ways to make three-dimensional objects. And so this is now the pattern for the, come on, this is now the pattern for the predominant pieces of the cocoons. And what you find is they're becoming increasingly more like uh, uh, fabric, even though they're made of stainless steel. And so what you have here, though, is an interesting thing because these lines, these dashed lines, represent folds. And we had a, a quite an interesting problem in this project because, um, drawing set, where I'm going backwards? No. Okay, so these are some of the drawings, and I'll, you'll see it in the real thing. Um, so um, we had to uh, design this, make it, take it apart, send it to Tokyo, because, because they had no access to their upper floor space by elevator or escalator or stair. Or, and stair was the only thing. The uh, owner of the building wouldn't allow them to take this in the elevators. They were too big for the escalators. And so we had to break it into pieces and carry them up the stairs. And so that caused an, a whole bunch of issues. But uh, we get, got them built at Quest Metalworks that make sinks and uh, commercial kitchens, and the, I, I should tell you that the guys who were making these were having as much fun as we were. I mean, they, they really got into it. They loved it. Uh, it was something, it just demonstrates that how much time everybody in the design business spends doing things that aren't as good as they can do, because their clients aren't as good as they should be. Uh, <laughs> And so here we have uh, the beginning of these guys, and they were really loving it. And what we were doing was we were learning how to transform some of the ideas of the wood into stainless steel. But stainless steel has its own unique characteristics, and the ability and the need to break these things into pieces uh, added enormous challenges to us. But there were some very interesting things. So one of the things we came to understand was that so we have a very robust steel shell, but a steel shell is very strong within its volume. At the edges, it's not so strong. At the edges, it needs help. And so we began to try and explore, and you can see an edge up top, which is the result of this exploration. So what we found was that we had originally planned that we would just take a bar, a light bar, and we'd stitch it onto the edge and that would uh, both give the edge thickness and stiffness and make it not so sharp. We couldn't do it. <laughs> a steel bar does not, this is a very complex curve. A steel bar will not do that. You have to really twist the element. What we found was, oh, it was a sort of a no-brainer. Here's the bar and here's a steel rod. A steel rod can follow that line and it is actually attached to the surface in a spiraling attachment as it moves along the edge. Because it's cylindrical, it doesn't have an orientation and therefore the whole issue of twisting is removed from the problem. And so they stitched it on and then they filled it and welded it. And you can see 
the character of these remarkable edges uh, and the quality of the uh, structure that results from that uh, edging. And then we had the problem of how do you put a door into it? Because this thing is a, is a change room and I'm desperately trying to uh, make this work. So, uh, and we had sort of, the project had gotten ahead of us. We were fabricating it before we figured it out. Not, not recommend it, I gotta tell you. And so, what we did was we went back in our shop and we built a wood version of this thing so we could play with the door. And the door is, was obviously, you look at the shape, we're trying to fill this shape with an operable door. Uh, and uh, we tried two doors, we tried a whole variety of things. And finally, we were able to get a door, which you see over there, and here it is uh, in the shop, where it's a steel rods that have been uh, clad with fabric, and uh, I think uh, worked out extremely well, and this was sort of on the fly. I mean, it's sort of, we were out there. Um, and then we were, had to figure out how to light the interior of this thing, because if it's a change room, you have to have lighting. And so we developed this translucent floor, and we picked this particular pattern, and this is it, and this is the actual in, uh, interior floor uh, of the thing. It's a kind of a magical space inside. And then we had to knock it down, take it apart. And so here you can see that some of the details, like the curvilinear base or the flat joint, are actually holding this thing. This is not rolled steel. That curve is not there as a result of deformation of the steel. That curve is there simply by virtue of the edge details that are holding it in that shape. Uh, it's a sprung form. It actually wants to go flat again. And so here are all those pieces. And here it is going back together again. Floor going in. And here it is all ready to go. This is the night before we package it up to go to Tokyo, and uh, uh, it has a remarkable physical presence. Uh, that uh, uh, quality of the surface is, which, and it's just been abraded. It's, uh, it's uh, 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 just stainless with just simple hand abrading. Um, with the door and the light. And there it is in Tokyo. And that's all I'm going to tell you about. <laughs> I can say that the book, these are three of the, the first three projects in the book. There are uh, additional projects, including this project, which we call Cut and Drawn. And Cut and Drawn, these projects have wandered into all sorts of alien territory. And so these projects are, we've, we've been sort of pushing them very hard for the last year and a half. And we are going to be having a show at Gallery Jones in November of this, uh, these pieces. And I invite you all to come to see. And the explanation of how we make them, which is pretty remarkable, because it takes about 30 seconds a minute to make one of these things once it's been prepped, um, is uh, kind of amazing. Uh, so uh, with that, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you enjoy the book. Well, now you all have to buy a book, right? To find out how it ends. It's like a great suspense story. Thank you. The passion and understanding of materials is phenomenal. I love it. I love the whole story. And you're in a great speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you all for attending. Um, John will be signing. John and Pat will be signing. And if there are questions. Yes, and if there are questions, if you would like to ask questions now or um, in person, across the desk. Oh, a question. What's, what's next? Uh, well, uh, uh, a project that, uh, it's not next because it's been under construction for quite a while, but we're building a temple for a yoga ashram in Kootenai Bay, British Columbia, which is, the, is an outcome of all of these uh, researches. 
And uh, it's a hard place to get to intentionally, uh, and it's kind of a remarkable thing. Uh, but uh, we're now working at very big scale. Oh, and excuse me. Yes, Presentation House Gallery is. When is it? Oh, uh, I don't know when Presentation House is going to open. It's a moving target. It's the fall, the fall of this year. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Book signing will start soon. <laughs>